Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Warning, this episode of Turning Tides contains graphic descriptions of racism, violence, murder, suicide, and mature themes. The birthplace of the American labor movement was also the birthplace of the United States as we know it today. In New England's Charles River Valley, an entrepreneur named Francis Cabot Lowell, who believed America had vast industrial and economic potential, was opening the first textile mill. It was 1814, and America had just been humiliated in the War of 1812. Famously, British redcoats ate the still-warm dinner of the Madison family, who had to hurriedly vacate the White House. American armies were woefully under-equipped and vastly under-supplied. The need for manufacturing in order to provide necessities to the American armed forces and public at large was made abundantly clear. Since the colonization of America by the British, the 13 colonies had been purposely deprived of industrial progress. It's clear the British were afraid of what an American industrial market would do to their own burgeoning industries. Once America won its independence, there were two major fields of thought as to what role America should play in the world market. Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans believed America should always remain an agricultural society built around small farmers and independent craftsmen, bound by a sense of duty and patriotism. Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists saw the need for Americans to not only produce their own goods, but to produce them on a massive industrial level, while also protecting the new industries through trade tariffs. In English cities like Manchester, the Industrial Revolution was already well underway, and its benefits and failings were clear to many. It enriched a new capitalist class, who believed in profiting by any means necessary, at the expense of their workforce, which was largely illiterate. Industrial workers lived on the edge of starvation in overcrowded, disease-ridden apartments. In America, it was promised that things would be different. The poverty, crime, and avarice created by the British ruling class was a distinctly European phenomenon. America had no royalty. It was a country founded on the principles of liberty and freedom. If an industrial capitalist class developed, they would function as a paternal entity, with the public good in mind and the moral and physical health of their workers at the forefront of their thoughts. It was in this climate that the Merrimack and Concord Rivers were used to power the first industrial town of Lowell, Massachusetts. Named after the recently deceased Francis Cabot, the small town grew rapidly. By 1836, it was a bustling manufacturing hub of 18,000. The factories almost exclusively employed women, with most workers being between the ages of 15 and 30. Supervised by males, they were assisted in their textile work by children. From first light to sunset, they spun cotton, which was picked by enslaved peoples in the South. During the summer, their workdays could last 14 hours in sweltering heat. Making about $3 a week, $1.25 of their paycheck would be used to cover room and board, which was provided by the company. Many women ended up clearing only a dollar a week. This breaks down to about two cents an hour for 72 hours of work. In spite of this, Many women found themselves making money and being semi-independent for the first time in their lives. One woman wrote home, quote, I earned $14 and a half. The folks think I get along just first rate. I like it as well as ever, and Sarah, don't I feel independent of everyone? The thought that I am living on no one is a happy one indeed to me, unquote. <laughs> 
This attitude makes sense when one considers that the only other outlet for female workers was grueling manual labor on their family farms. In many ways, the first textile mills of Lowell were revolutionary. The owners believed in many of the revolutionary promises upon which America was founded. In contrast, the Second Great Awakening was inspiring people all across the nation to return to their Puritan roots. This led to textile mill bosses attempting to police their employees. They hired, quote, mature Christian women, unquote, to serve as surrogate mothers and moral proselytizers to the young women in their care. On the other hand, the bosses allowed the workers under their employ to edit their own magazine called The Offering. It was the first of its kind and offered a look into the lives of the women working there. One edition says, quote, One nation can look upon the relics of a glory come and gone. We have other and better things. Let us look upon our lyceums, our common schools, the periodical of our laboring females, upon all that is indigenous to our republic, and say, with the spirit of the Roman Cornelia, these, these are our jewels, unquote. The Lowell miracle was becoming a national spectacle, and the textile mill was visited by President Andrew Jackson and Senator Frontiersman Davy Crockett. These publicity stunts and the manipulated silence of many women workers held for a time, but more and more complaints about long hours were surfacing on the pages of the offering. Having no pretext for the hours, bosses simply went off agricultural hours, sun up to sunset. This did not account for the idle moments in farming, and the fact that one did not farm inside a cramped, badly ventilated factory surrounded by a hundred other people. Women were truly exhausted by the end of their shift, and many experienced severe medical problems. These initial complaints were largely ignored by bosses and overseers, but the first reports of worker quote-unquote mutiny were being recorded. Young women were not simply going to be exploited for the sake of newspapers and public perception. By 1834, much of the luster surrounding Lowell was fading, the company was actively discussing cutting wages of its workers by 15%. This would not stand for an anonymous woman called a dictatress by her supervisor. She rallied 800 of her fellow seamstresses and struck against the company. She mounted a fire pump and delivered a rousing speech to her fellow workers. It was the first time the Boston transcript recalled seeing a woman speak in public. The women marched and their demonstration was called an, quote, Amazonian display, unquote, by the mill operators. Many women were blacklisted and forced out of their lodgings. Many others feared such an event and acquiesced to the pay decrease. The ignominious beginning of the American labor movement had stirred. Although beaten, the women of Lowell had learned a valuable lesson about organizing. The next chance to fight for their meager wage was in 1836, when mill owners announced that women would be charged an extra 25 cents for room and board. 1,500 women struck so suddenly and so aggressively that the bosses acquiesced to their demands, and the first victory for organized labor was tallied. Behind the textiles created by these women was the inhumane and unjust practice of black chattel enslavement. Enslaved peoples provided the overwhelming majority of cotton, which the woman later spun into thread. It was an undeniable fact. The wealth of northern industry relied heavily on the labor of enslaved black people in the South. This contradiction was apparent and abhorrent to many who lived and worked in the abolitionist New England region. Many workers considered themselves quote-unquote wage slaves. To them, the mill owner of the North was as bad as the human trafficker of the South. This perspective did more harm than good to the labor movement, as white abolitionists considered this view offensive, while the rank and file turned this idea in its head to push forth racist sentiments. These racists believed that when black workers were freed, they would be used as strike breakers, which, in turn, would bring down the wages of white men. The labor movement in America was, and is still, stained by racism, as is the majority of American history.
race was constantly used by capitalists and bosses to divide working class movements, and it was incredibly effective at destroying many of them. It was even used by Confederate apologists to demonstrate that chattel enslavement was not all that bad, as these human traffickers had to theoretically house, feed, and care for those they enslaved, while a capitalist could work someone to death and easily replace them at no loss. This argument would continue for decades, and race would be a prime point of divergence for the labor movement in the coming years. As the 1840s began, there were active efforts to change society. As many believed the current manufacturing system of capitalism was passive and cruel. One of the leading thinkers who facilitated these changes was Parisian Charles Fourier. Philip Dre says, quote, Fourier envisioned rural agricultural and industrial units of approximately 1,500 gathered in a collective. The members would serve the larger entities according to one's personal aptitude or expertise, unquote. These communities were seen as serious alternatives to factory life, and they were located everywhere from Long Island, New York, to the Midwest and beyond. Almost a million people were members of utopian settlements during the 1840s. Brook Farm was one of the most successful of these communities, operating a community school which was attended by Robert Gould Shaw, famous leader of the all-black 54th Massachusetts Infantry during the Civil War. Unfortunately, many of these utopian communities completely failed. At Brook Farm, a fire destroyed the main communal structure in 1846. Alongside the utopians, there were more practical political movements as well. The National Reform Association believed in the idea of free soil. Their anti-slavery stance alienated many Southern workers from the start, but they found traction in immigrant and working communities in the North. Free soil had little to do with abolitionism, as many were anti-slavery solely because they feared what enslaved people's labor could do to their own wages. The Free Soil Party would be dissolved by 1854, but its members, Whigs and anti-slavery Democrats, would go on to start a new party called the Republicans. Years of economic downturn had turned the Lowell miracle into more of a purgatory. Every year there were new reports of worker disturbances, but as of yet the workers had no legal means of banding together. American courts maintained that labor or trade unions were illegal combinations and conspiracies. This did not mean that workers were passive. They actively campaigned for a 10-hour working day. Seth Luther was at the forefront of pamphleteering for early labor rights. A textile worker named Octavia put it well, quote, What are we coming to? Here am I, a healthy New England girl, quite well-behaved, bestowing just half of my hours, including Sundays, upon a company for less than two cents an hour, and out of the other half of my time, I am obliged to wash, mend, read, reflect, go to church, etc. I repeat it. What are we coming to? Unquote. The issue was at the heart of the 1827 Philadelphia Carpenter Strike, which led directly to Martin Van Buren's executive order, which standardized the 10-hour day for federal workers and contracts in 1840. Riding this success, Sarah Bagley became a preeminent spokesperson for the cause. She and her followers were threatened with blacklisting. Bagley was flabbergasted. She said, quote, deprive us, after working 13 hours of the poor privilege of finding fault, of saying our lot is a hard one, intentionally turn away a girl, unjustly prosecuted for free expression of honest political opinions? We will make the name of him who dares the act stink with every wind from all points of the compass. He shall be hissed in the streets and in all the cities of this widespread republic, for our name is Legion, though our oppression is great." Unquote. Bagley would go on to dismantle the Lowell offering through repeated attacks in the press. Seth Luther, meanwhile, thought it ridiculous that the United States followed British precedent in regards to trade unions, saying, quote, The Declaration of Independence was the work of a combination, 
and was as hateful to the traitors and Tories of those days as combinations among working men are now to the avarice monopolist, unquote. In the rest of the Northeast, trade unionism was spreading in spite of the continued condemnation in the courts. Against precedent, the workers of Boston created a city-wide union. When a member did unsolicited work for a boss and failed to report it to his union representatives, he was fined a dollar for the infraction. In response, this worker denounced the union and took the workers' combination of Boston to court. The judge was anti-union, but the defense lawyer used clever courtroom tactics and appealed to the judge's patriotism to confound the prosecution's arguments. By the end of the trial, the judge was saying that unions were a form of capitalist competition and an overall good to the public. This case, Commonwealth v. Hunt, is referred to by many as the, quote, Magna Carta of American trade unionism, unquote. I assume the Supreme Court will overturn this case next. Meanwhile, Sarah Bagley's fight for equal treatment and fair wages was scoffed at by politicians who cared little for women's issues. Women could not vote, so why would an elected official listen to their complaints? They called the women complaining of 14-hour workdays, quote, farmers' daughters, unquote, who showed up to work for a few years and quickly settled down to start a family. So any ordeal they went through wouldn't be for that long. In spite of Bagley's continued prodding, the 10-hour workday proved elusive for many workers tasked with some of the hardest work in the country. By the 1850s, only New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Maine, and Connecticut had something akin to a 10-hour workday law. As revolutions racked Europe in 1848, a far more subtle revolution was occurring in Seneca Falls, New York. Organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Jane Hunt, and the Mott sisters, the Seneca Falls Convention is considered by many to be the start of the women's rights movement in America. It was supported by a hundred-odd trailblazers. Newspapers called the women in attendance, quote, sour old maids, unquote. Bagley would leave the spotlight of the labor movement, becoming the country's first female telegraph operator. She left this job after discovering her male predecessor made much more money than her. Finding a soulmate, she settled down in a Brooklyn brownstone and pioneered homeopathic non-intrusive medicines. Back in Lowell, the town was stumbling down from its industrial peak. Instead of employing local women, the textile mills were populated by more and more immigrants from the British Isles, Ireland, and Germany. The national economy had been sputtering throughout the 1850s, and on January 10, 1860, the Pemberton textile mill suffered a fire which caused the building to collapse. The horrific event killed 88 workers and injured hundreds more. It showcased the dangers many faced on a daily basis. The Irish workers were sent back to their paddy camps, and life struggled on. Right by Lowell was the small shoemaking town of Lynn. In recent years, it had exploded in profitability as an industrial shoe-producing city. This growth deeply destabilized the people of the area, as traditional shoemaking families lost out repeatedly to the newest technology. Even the best cobbler in the world was no match for the ruthless efficiency of a sewing machine. 20,000 shoemakers were on strike for three months right before the Civil War began in earnest. The law in Lynn was showcasing some of the truly draconian steps law enforcement took to controlling people's lives during the 19th century. Gambling, swimming in the nude, and profanity were banned in the city, while the temperance movement won its first major victory in Lynn with the banning of all liquor. To make matters worse, Developers were swarming the seaside town and turning the once plentiful clam beds of the coast into houses for the rich. The poor were being constricted into smaller and smaller parcels of public land and allowed fewer economic opportunities as well. When the factory bosses said they needed to cut wages to deal with the crippling economic recession, workers stepped in and attempted to compromise with their bosses. They endeavored to get the government to subsidize a mutually agreed-to work stoppage, but bosses balked at this offer. In 
It was Washington's birthday, February 22, 1860, when 20,000 people took to the streets, carrying American flags and banners which read, quote, Our cause is just and our union perfect, unquote. Shoemakers arrived from across the region to support. The next day, things became less than perfect. Rumors spread that bosses were sending stockpiled shoes to market, and the wagon drivers who supposedly had the shoes were roughed up by angry workers. A town constable was dragged along the ground by an angry crowd and had to draw his gun before being released. The next day, February 24th, a trainload of Boston police arrived, which only inflamed the crowds further. Trailed by the mob and derisively jeered, a stone was thrown which hit a police officer in the head. This started a general melee. Instigator and spectator were bludgeoned by the surrounded police. The Boston police were withdrawn from Lynn the following day, and the strike proceeded in a much less violent manner. The striking men of Lynn did not expect that many women amongst the striking workers were seeking higher wages, too. Women were expected to support the men, but not ask for more themselves. Clara Brown protested vehemently to these expectations. She said, quote, Strike at once. Demand eight and a half cents for your work when the binding isn't closed, and you will get it. Don't let them make slaves of you. Keep still. Don't work your machines. Let them lie still till we get all we ask, and then go at it, as did our mothers in the Revolution. Unquote. However, Many women supported, or were made to support, their husbands. In the end, despite Clara Brown's protests, the women of Lynn, who manufactured the uppers of the shoe, acquiesced to their husbands and accepted only seven cents per pair of finished shoe. The strike was the last gasp to maintain some individualism and tradition in an industry which had flourished in the area since the 16th century. Wages did increase, but manufacturers sold off extra stock as the strike proceeded, and the Civil War turned shoes into one of the most important and profitable industries in the entire country. In spite of this, the 1860 Lynn Shoemaker strike left an indelible imprint on the area and on folk memory. When asked about the Lynn strike, the radical, long-shot presidential candidate Abraham Lincoln said, quote, I am glad to see a system of labor prevail in New England under which laborers can strike when they want to, when they are not obliged to labor whether you pay them or not. I like a system which lets a man quit when he wants, and wish it might prevail everywhere." Unquote. Abraham Lincoln was elected thanks in no small part to union and working class support. He also enjoyed support from tens of thousands of liberal German immigrants who had recently moved to the United States. The state governments of the South would not abide by an openly anti-slavery president, and many states left the Union. In total, 11 states would choose to sever their relations to the country and begin sending armies into the field to fight the Northern Yankee. Abraham Lincoln bided his time, and, in a brilliant strategic move, forced the Southern Confederacy to initiate hostilities by refusing to leave Fort Sumter and instead sending provisions to federal troops there. Lincoln called for volunteers, and the workers' unions, who were extremely loyal to Lincoln during the election, showed the same zeal in enlisting. Whole unions would volunteer together and often serve in the same unit, leading to many units being wiped out together in battle. This conflict paused the labor movement for a time, the main focus was clearly against the oligarchs and human traffickers of the Confederacy. Karl Marx welcomed the conflict from an ocean away, saying it was the final step in the United States becoming a full bourgeoisie democracy, as he equated the Confederacy to European-style nobility. Serving in the Union's ranks were 216,000 German-born men. 210,000 were black people who lived free in the North, and escaped slaves who came to fight their traffickers. 200,000 were Irish, 90,000 were Dutch, another 100,000 were from Canada or England. There were also 40,000 Frenchmen under Union arms, 20,000 Scandinavians, and another 30,000 or so Jewish, Italian, Mexican, Polish, and Native peoples 
It was one of the most diverse armies the world had ever seen to that point. Additionally, the Civil War turbocharged northern industry, which was being supplemented by not only the government, but also massive reserves of cheap labor from Ireland. In the words of Shelby Foote, it was the beginning of the age of shoddy. Large monopolies were beginning to form in the realms of oil, steel, and sugar. The most powerful corporations in the country and in the world, however, were the railroads. The growth was unprecedented, and many railroad barons became rich beyond measure. For the first time in its history, the United States had more people working in factories than tilling soil. Industrial growth went hand in hand with the growth of workers' organizations. The typographical, the iron molders and workers, and the machinist unions were all founded during this violent, life-altering conflict. Following the war's end, the country was fundamentally changed forever. Abolitionists succeeded in passing several civil rights amendments to the Constitution, and an era of military reconstruction was promised in the South. However, following the horrifying and traumatic war, Many abolitionists lost the will to see their plans through, and quite frankly, a vast majority of the population did not care about the plight of black people who were now free. Lincoln was assassinated, dooming Reconstruction from the start. In theory, the Civil War opened new avenues of migration to black people. They could theoretically escape their confines in the South and head to northern cities to look for work in factories. No longer was America the small, insecure, agriculturally focused nation. It was now a massive coast-to-coast -coast empire with tendrils extending over the ocean toward future American colonies and subsidiaries. American factories spread without end, and the new normal for working people had only just begun to sink in. With the end of the Civil War, one of the largest figures in American labor history took the scene. William Silvis was the son of a wagon maker. While he did not have a formal education, he made up for what he lacked in book smarts with sheer intensity and passion. To quote the New York Times, Perseverance and determination are as plainly written upon his countenance as if they were written there in indelible ink. Unquote. He spent his short life fighting endlessly for the iron molders he represented traveling from town to town, always in poor health and constantly out of money. He was a neglectful father and husband, completely devoted to the cause for which he stood. Philip Dre says that Silvis believed organized labor was a, quote, powerful locomotive, sitting in readiness on a track, but without sufficient fuel to move forward. Only a unified movement of workers could do that, could wield the power needed to confront capital, unquote. In Silvis' own words, he asks, quote, Why does capital take to itself the whole loaf while labor is left to gather up the crumbs? Why does capital roll in luxury and wealth while labor is left to eke out a miserable existence in poverty and want? Are these the evidences of an identity of interests, of mutual relations, of equal partnership? No. On the contrary, these are the evidences of an antagonism a never-ending conflict between the two classes, where capital is in all cases the aggressor." Unquote. By all accounts, Silvis was incredibly detail-oriented. He standardized the collection of dues, while also creating a massive index card system to keep track of enlisted union members. He was an uncompromising and frightful spectacle when angry, which was most of the time. Silvis believed all workers belonged in a union, so when some refused, or even worse, some chose to scab, Philip Dre says, quote, he could become apoplectic, unquote. He kept with him a scab album, where he tracked names and addresses of known strike breakers. Silvis once said of scabs, quote, what can be done with such trash? You cannot call them humans without libeling the whole human race, unquote. Regardless of his feelings toward anti-union workers, his tireless activities led to the founding of the National Labor Union, or NLU, in 1866. It was the first ever National Labor Federation of its kind, 
the union was not devoted to any single trade or industry, but rather to the entire country's workforce, making it entirely unique. It was inclusive to the skilled and unskilled laborer, farmers, women, and black people. They were influential in many post-war movements, including the Greenback Movement and the Grange Movement. The NLU also supported workers' cooperatives and the fight for the 10-hour and 8-hour day. The movement for an 8-hour day began with the idea that one should work for 8 hours, sleep for 8 hours, and relax or attend to other duties for 8 hours. This balance was essential. Additionally, the shortening of hours would create more jobs, allowing a greater number of people to find employment. With returning soldiers numbering in the hundreds of thousands, it was a logical and humane next step for mass industry. Alongside the eight-hour movement, workers' cooperatives were popping up throughout the country. They ranged the gambit from neighborhood banks to home associations to worker-owned industries. In many ways, this was the capitalism envisioned by Adam Smith when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. These cooperatives lacked the capital needed to get started and could not withstand the many natural shocks which plagued the market. Silvis turned to the federal government and asked for money and gifts of public land for cooperatives. Although this was essentially the same arrangement made with the railroads, it was decried as, quote, an offshoot of communism, hostile to property, and therefore to civilization, unquote. With the upcoming economic collapse of 1873, Cooperatives were doomed before they had a chance to flourish. Some cooperatives still exist in America today. A prime example is the Nevada grocery store Winco, which is completely employee-owned. While the unions attempted to push these initiatives, there were internal squabbles about the admittance of black people and women to these organizations. Many felt that women simply shouldn't be paid as much as a man. Early women's rights advocates were angry that so much emphasis was placed on black emancipation while white women were also suffering. Meanwhile, white male workers were frustrated that either white women or black people were being given a seat at the table. Many openly complained when Elizabeth Cady Stanton was invited to speak at an NLU gathering. Also at this meeting was Susan B. Anthony, who pointed out the undeniable fact that if women were paid equally to men, all labor would reap the benefits. If a boss could pay a woman less, he could pay a man less as well. In spite of this fact, most union rank and file were completely against women getting the right to vote. One worker complained that if women could vote, then his wife could cancel out his vote purely out of marital spite. Uh, okay. When women were found to be used as strike breakers in New York, Susan B. Anthony asserted that women needed the skills and that she assented to their continued employment. Women were quickly removed from the NLU. While at first admitting black people, the NLU quickly redacted their support for black members and asked any black member of the NLU to form their own separate union. The Colored National Labor Union was set up in 1869. Rayford Logan says, quote, the first large exclusion of black people by private organization in the post-bellum period was the handiwork of organized labor, unquote. Silvis and the famed Susan B. Anthony held racist views about black people and their intelligence. It was the norm even amongst the progressives of the time. Anti-racists like Wendell Phillips were far from this median. Throughout the rest of the country, the plight of black people was being pushed to the side, Reconstruction was proving to be a colossal failure. Promised land distribution never occurred, and Southern generals and statesmen were pardoned for their roles in the conflict which claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. The expulsion of black workers from the NLU was another clear blight on the American labor movement. W.E.B. Du Bois says, quote, Black people were welcome to the labor movement, not because they were laborers, but because they might be competitors in the market. And the logical conclusion was either to organize them or guard against their actual competition by other methods, unquote. One of the fundamental problems was that black people overwhelmingly supported the Republican Party, while white working men overwhelmingly supported the Democrats. After years of poor health and stomach issues, William Silvis died suddenly at the age of 41. 
His death was a calamity for the early labor movement. Without his leadership, there was little to stop the flow of events which would culminate in insurrection and violence. He had spent every penny he had ever made on the movement. His widow was forced to borrow money to pay the undertaker. His legacy is enduring. Many modern union members call him, quote, our Lincoln, unquote. However, his controversial views on reconstruction and race cannot be ignored. And his failure to support women and black workers demonstrates the supreme failure of America as a nation. For his many blatant failings, Silvis was the first person to suggest the Department of Labor, and it's undeniable the influence Silvis had on the workers he represented. Silvis died right before one of the great mining disasters in American history. Along the spine of the Appalachian mountain chain lies the anthracite region of Pennsylvania. Named for the rich deposits of coal which literally burst out of the ground, it was home to mining operations since William Penn was first granted the rights to found a royal colony in the area. The Quakers who inhabited Pennsylvania were peace-loving. This would not do for the militant James Logan, who called for Presbyterians from Scotland and Northern Ireland to come to Pennsylvania. These Scot-Irish came in considerable numbers. Mark Bullock estimates, quote, that between 1700 and 1776, 200,000 people left Ulster for America, unquote. These first immigrants formed the militant backbone of Pennsylvania's militia during Pontiac's War. After all, they had considerable experience suppressing native peoples back in Ireland. Many of this first wave were Protestant, but in time, millions of Irish Catholics would leave for America as well. Hundreds of thousands would be from the Ulster borderlands, where sectarian infighting and agrarian violence was par for the course. Of the many secret societies which permeated the Irish countryside, one of the most notorious were the Molly Maguires, a secret society bent on violence, whose purpose was to maintain the traditional Irish way of life by whatever means necessary. They targeted landlords specifically. These rabble-rousers left an indelible mark on Irish immigration as the secret society found its way to America. To understand the heart of the Molly Maguire movement, we have to discuss Ireland, Ulster, and Mummery. Very few customs translate well from England and Scotland to Ireland. Famously, the Irish refused the Anglican Church sticking to their traditional Catholicism, while also maintaining the Irish language at home, away from eavesdropping British constables. In Ulster, Presbyterianism prevailed not because of native conversion, but because of foreign displacement and colonization. The aforementioned Scot-Irish were a substantial portion of the Ulster population, usually controlling the economic life of the entire region. In response, secret societies formed, which blossomed well in the countryside. There were the Catholic ribbon men and defenders, while the Protestants had the Pipa Day boys and the volunteers. These were only a couple of the secret societies which existed in Ireland throughout its violent history. Karl Marx commented that secret societies spread in Ireland like mushrooms in a forest. The final piece in understanding the Molly Maguires is the act of mummery. Mummery is one of the few practices that was brought over from Great Britain. In an event similar to Halloween trick-or-treating, Young men would arrive at your house dressed up, usually in dresses, and almost always in mime makeup or blackface. Instead of asking for candy, they performed a play. The play always involved a fight to the death between mythical figures. Depending on the neighborhood, the figures changed. If you were in Catholic Ireland, the protagonist was a Catholic hero vanquishing a heretic. If you were in Protestant Ulster, King George was usually slaying St. Patrick. After the slaying of this ultimate evil, a man, dressed in traditionally women's clothing, would ask for donations in order to heal the dead warrior. These donations were used to throw an end-of-the-year party. Then, the dead warrior would rise again in an eternal battle between good and evil.
It was intentionally abrasive and in your face. It was meant to solidify the bonds of the Irish community throughout the long British occupation. Those that refused the mummers or did not donate sufficiently were making clear that they wanted nothing to do with the rest of the community. This led to social alienation and even violence if you were unpopular enough. In short, mummery was used as a kind of social glue and was a means of outreach, bonding, and political theater. It found its way to Pennsylvania, and the mummers were nearly indistinguishable from the Molly Maguires, as both performed and killed in the same garb. A Molly Maguire death squad would come to people's houses dressed as mummers. This was meant to signify that the killing was done with the community's blessing and for the community's benefit. This was not socialism or populism. James S. Donnelly aptly called it localism. The community was the only means of support in Ireland, so the community was everything. In Pennsylvania, the coal towns of the Anthracite were seeing a bubbling of the same bloodshed which occurred in Ulster, under men claiming the same name, Molly Maguire. During the Civil War, they were vehemently anti-Republican. The majority of the Irish population were overwhelmingly Democrat, as Democrats often supported immigrants, at least in name. Republicans, on the other hand, were anti-immigration and had many xenophobic know-nothings, or those who detested immigration while claiming they were Native Americans in their party ranks. Additionally, military conscription was widely hated by Irish immigrants, while Republicans overwhelmingly supported it. Irish immigrants also tended to be incredibly racist, seeing black people as competition and causing their share of race riots throughout Pennsylvania. At the draft's beginning, the anthracite region was targeted by draft officers specifically for its democratic leanings. Prior to 1863, enlisted soldiers did not have the ability to vote. So as a way of rigging the election, Republicans would draft soldiers from largely Democratic districts, thus disenfranchising them. The anti-draft sentiment grew to such an extent that authorities in the anthracite were worried about tens of thousands of miners joining General Lee's invading Confederate army. These voting rules changed after some time, and now the draft was being used to target, quote, troublesome labor organizers, unquote. As the Civil War ended, these organizers were back home, and they began the WBA, or Working Men Benevolence Association, under the leadership of John Sinney, or Sinney. Sinney and the WBA garnered the support of many Pennsylvania miners. The WBA was quickly becoming a statewide entity in the most productive mining sector in the entire country. They gained serious political traction, helping to introduce several bills to the state legislature designed to add more safety to the mining profession. Unfortunately, their safety bill failed to pass the state senate, leaving mine collieries without a safety inspector of any kind, nor a required second exit. Samuel G. Turner was the coal dealer who shot down the measure, saying, quote, I can remember but one instance where fire damp explosions resulted in injury to miners in the country. Unquote. These words would turn out to be pathetic. On September 5, 1869, the worst mining disaster to ever occur in the United States to that point took place in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. Not even the rats had enough warning to escape. A fire started underground, which collapsed the single-shaft mine, trapping 179 men and boys underground. Entire neighboring townships added their labor to relief efforts, frantically trying to dig an alternate escape route for the people inside. There was no hope. John Siney arrived shaking mad. He said, quote, You can do nothing to win these men back to life, but you can help me to win fair treatment and justice for the living who risk life and health in their daily toil. Men, if you must die, die with your boots on. Die for your families, your homes, your country. But do not longer consent to die like rats in a trap for those who take no more interest in you than in the pick you dig with." Unquote. Samuel G. Turner's words were recounted, and his political life, as well as his actual life, were in serious danger. He joined with the WBA, 
to pass the Pennsylvania Mine Safety Act. For the men and boys who died screaming, it was too little, too late. Turner lost overwhelmingly in the next election. Even with new safety stipulations, between the year 1870 and 1875, over 550 miners were killed in cave-ins, gas leaks, and workplace accidents. A popular children's rhyme went, quote, Oh, Daddy, don't work in the mines today, for dreams so often come true. Oh, Daddy, dear Daddy, please don't go away. I never could live without you, unquote. Demands on the individual miner were beyond exorbitant. In the 1860s, a single miner was expected to extract 2.5 tons of coal a day. Twenty years later, the number was now 9 tons, until finally in the 1920s, it was a mine numbing 16.5 tons. These miners were paid with writs only spendable at the company-owned store. The company store owner often overcharged for these basic goods. By the end of the year, many miners owed money to the company that they worked for. These terrifying standards led to the famous song, You load 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Back in the anthracite, Franklin B. Gowan president of the Philadelphia and Reading Line, was determined to crush the WBA. He wished to monopolize the entire coal industry throughout the state, from its mining to its transportation. Gowan was not able to own coal mines directly because of his status as a railroad official, so he set up dummy companies to operate in his name. He purchased the local canal and then shut it down making coal producers dependent solely on his rail line. Finally, he perverted the distinction between the Molly Maguires and the workers' union. While the WBA operated, murders were almost non-existent in the anthracite region. Prior to the miners' union, there were dozens of unsolved murders that followed the patterns of a classic Molly Maguire killing. Whatever relationship existed between the union men and the Mollies, it seemed to be one which prevented violence. Gowan did not care. He wished to have his profits. Within three years, Gowan would own 100,000 acres of prime Pennsylvania mining country. He got New York City to agree to a fixed rate of only $5 a ton for PA coal. In addition to this, he crippled the WBA. In 1873, he was granted permission to start a private law enforcement agency called the Coal and Iron Police. He would use these hired mercenaries to arrest labor leaders on trumped-up charges. In 1873, he met with Alan Pinkerton, leader of the detective agency, the Pinkertons. Pinkerton was a highly religious and authoritative man. He famously collected information for the Union during the Civil War. Extravagant stories he was told about the Molly Maguires was all he needed to act decisively. He sent one of his best detectives, the Irish Catholic James McParlane, to infiltrate the secret society. He succeeded in his objective, pretending to be a wandering worker on the run for murder. While he may not have instigated any crimes, his introduction into the secret society shook its whole structure. Power changed hands, and more violent men took charge, leading to more and more killings. It was as bad as the violence in the region during the Civil War and the draft. Following a bloody riot, which involved a gun battle between state militia and Union strikers, the WBA was broken. Their efforts to fight against monopoly and unquenched capitalism were for naught. It was now the time of hard men. The Mollies would emerge once more from the underground, as if springing to life at the request of the community to seek vengeance in the old way. One such threatening notice of the Mollies read, quote, This is to give you, the Gap Men, a clear understanding that if you don't quit work after this notice, you may prepare for your death. You are the most damnedest turncoats in this state. There is no place fit for you boot hell, and you will be soon there, Molly, unquote. 
Another makes clear the reason for violence, quote, I am against shooting as much as ye are, but the union is broke up and we have got nothing to defend ourselves but our revolvers, and if we do not use them, we shall have to work for 50 cents a day." Unquote. By 1875, 347 names were turned over to Gowan and dozens were arrested in connection with the secret society. By May 1876, Gowan was prosecuting the men considered to be Mollies. He packed the juries with highly conservative Dutch and Quaker farmers. Gowan said, quote, Behind the Molly Maguires stalked darkness and despair, brooding like grim shadows over the desolated hearth and the ruined home. And throughout the length and breadth of this fair land was heard the voice of wailing and lamentation. Unquote. On June 21st, 1876, the jury's verdict came in, and it was a foregone conclusion. Both Republican and Democrat had smothered the labor movement in the anthracite for the purpose of gaining wealth and coal. Ten men were sent to the gallows on June 21, 1877. It was known as the Day of the Rope, or Black Thursday. Hoping to end labor unrest once and for all, the country was about to plunge into what can only be described as a class war. Starting in 1873, an economic panic caused by unfettered capitalism and war swept the world at large. In Vienna, Austria, everyone withdrew their money from the banks, creating a ripple effect throughout the globe. In the United States, the panic took the form of the failure of many financial firms, the largest of which was J. Cook & Co. As the economy collapsed, so did dozens of national unions. From 1870 to 1877, 23 national unions broke apart. The NLU had folded alongside the cooperatives it supported. The Paris Commune had terrified the ruling class. Authorities now connected labor agitation with foreign politics like Marxist communism. Additionally, social Darwinism, quite contradictory to the beliefs of its namesake, was garnering huge traction with the country's government officials and intellectuals. These callous officials did nothing as five million unemployed people begged for work. In September 1873, 15,000 unemployed marched in New York City. The authorities sent in the cavalry, who came in charging, quote, like Cossacks, according to a Russian immigrant. The cavalry ran people over, bludgeoning them with clubs. In early 1874, Susquehanna workers on the Erie Line seized company premises. They had not been paid for weeks. In response, the railroad bosses fired the ringleaders. This act infuriated the men, and they disabled approximately 1,000 separate trains. In the end, the railroad companies threatened the entire community. If the strike continued, they would move their entire rail shop facility from Susquehanna to Elmira. Panicked local businessmen finally turned on the strikers, and fearing alienation, the railroad workers returned unwillingly to their jobs. But this was a sign of things to come. July 1876 marked the 100-year anniversary of the country's founding. The centennial was defined by patriotic celebrations. Underneath the surface, however, rage was festering. All across the country, wages were being cut, Hours were being increased, and despair was the primary feeling of the day. Ulysses S. Grant and his presidency were now associated with corruption and mismanagement. The association was extended, not without reason, to the entire Republican Party. The 1876 presidential election was one of the most fraudulent in the history of the country. By all counts, Democrat Samuel Tilden was the winner, but behind the scenes, deals were made, and the South threw its support behind his fraudulency, Rutherford B. Hayes, who in turn promised federal money to the Southern Railroad and the end of Northern Reconstruction. The railroads were now in virtual control of the country, and their carelessness was on full display on the snow-laden night of December 29, 1876. A Lakeshore Pacific train traveling east of Ashtabula, Ohio, wrecked in the darkness. 160 people on the train perished, 
Those who survived recounted hearing the dying screams of those trapped under overturned train cars. Several months later, it was the courts that delivered another blow to railroad monopolists. In Munn v. Illinois, the constitutionality of Granger laws was established. Basically, this allowed state governments to restrict commerce and crack down on monopolists. Railroads now started banding together and would even support one another if one railroad owner was dealing with a strike. By choosing to avoid the problems their workers had, the railroads only increased tensions. Things finally boiled over, and the railroad workers of the B&O at Martinsburg, West Virginia, struck after another wage cut was announced. Now firemen were expected to make $1.58 a day, while brakemen had their wages cut to only $1.35 a day. Abruptly, the men stopped working. The mayor arrived and ordered the strikers detained, but the sympathetic townspeople surrounded the mayor's men and forced them to release the strikers. Next morning, the militia arrived, and after the militia was foiled in attempting to move trains, a firefight exploded between soldiers and a pistol-armed brakeman. The brakeman was killed, and several militia were wounded. The militia, who were themselves working men, wanted nothing to do with fighting their neighbors. Many departed the scene. Hayes was called upon to send federal troops to Martinsburg. He accepted and sent 300 troops under W.H. French to control what was being described as an insurrection. They succeeded in getting some trains moving, but these were constantly harassed by neighboring workers. Next, trouble was reported at Cumberland. Two regiments of the Maryland National Guard were dispatched to control the population. Their march became a harassed sprint, as along the way to the depot, soldiers were followed by 15,000 angry and violent protesters who hurled abuses and bricks at the National Guardsmen. A third regiment was called up, and they were likewise harassed, nearly half of their number deserting in the face of the mob. The rest of the regiment levied their rifles at the crowd and killed ten men and boys. The depot was besieged by the crowd still present. Hayes quickly dispatched more federal troops, but by this time, the telegraph was alight with countrywide insurrections. The two largest railroad lines in the country were now striking, and alongside them were hundreds of thousands of disgruntled and unemployed people in search of rights, food, or some way to get even. The trouble spread, and the next city to feel the sting of open-class warfare was Pittsburgh. Word arrived at the Pittsburgh rail yard that a double-header was inbound. A double-header is a train with two crews and two separate engine cars. These trains were twice as dangerous and twice as difficult to service, but also twice as profitable. A single flagman named Gus Harris refused to service the incoming train. His example was followed by everyone else on the shift. Word spread, and the sympathetic steel town population began encircling the rail yard. A flagman, Andrew Heiss, explained the spontaneous strike thusly, quote, It's a question of bread or blood, and we're going to resist. If I go to the penitentiary, I can get bread and water, and that's about all I can get now, unquote. Pittsburgh is a massive city, so stoppages here would have become a serious hindrance to the railroad's bottom line. The economic depression, however, had crippled the local government's ability to respond to the strikes. Due to budget cuts, the entire city of Pittsburgh had only eight police officers available to deal with the citywide protest. Even the federal army was small when compared to its numbers today. Only around 15,000 to 20,000 soldiers were active throughout the entire United States and most of them were on the western frontier attacking the indigenous people of the plains. By early June, the Trainmen's Union, a rail federation under the leadership of a 25-year-old brakeman, Robert Amons, was founded. They passed a formal resolution to continue the strike for as long as the Pennsylvania Railroad continued its double-header train policy. They passed several other resolutions calling for reforms in the industry and equalization of wages. One supporting mill worker said, quote, We're with you. I won't call employers despots. I won't call them tyrants. But the term capitalist is sort of synonymous and will do as well. Unquote. Militia units were called in, but they refused to fire on their countrymen. 
Instead, they neatly stacked their arms and fraternized with the protesting masses. To counter this rank insubordination, authorities called up the 1st Division of the Pennsylvania National Guard. This elite militia unit was composed of men strictly from Philadelphia. Now, if anyone knows anything about Pennsylvania, it's that Pittsburgh and Philadelphia share a bitter intrastate rivalry. The arrival of the Philly militia in Pittsburgh was tantamount to fighting fire with gasoline. This provocative move was intentional. They wanted the protest to end and they did not care about the human cost. As the trains rolled into Pittsburgh's rail yard, they showed definite signs of wear and tear. All along their route, they had been harried by stones and bricks thrown by angry western Pennsylvanians. Once they exited their cars, the Philly militia was confronted by 6,000 Pittsburghians. They fired a volley in the air, and when the crowd refused to give way, the militia fired into the crowd. Twenty people died, and dozens of others were injured. Amongst the injured were many children. The next morning, headlines read, Shot in cold blood by the rough hands of Philadelphia. The Lexington of the labor conflict is at hand. Citizens began arming themselves. They stormed a prominent weapons dealer in the area and proceeded to place the Philly militia under siege in the roundhouse structure in which they were stationed. First, they captured the militia's supply wagon, denying them any food or water. Next, Philip Dre says the mob, quote, seized freight cars loaded with oil and coal, set them ablaze, and pushed them downhill toward the building. By Sunday morning, the roundhouse was on fire and the captive guardsmen had no choice but to evacuate as best they could. Several soldiers were struck by bullets as they headed for the safety of the arsenal, prompting a commander to order a Gatling gun, fired to disperse those who continued to harass the troops. Unquote. It would not be the last time machine guns were used on workers by state militia and National Guard units. The crowd moved on to Pennsylvania Railroad property, ripping up track and sabotaging trains and freight cars all along the way. Throughout the rest of the country, workers were marching and striking for their rights. In Galveston, Texas, black longshoremen were at the head of the strike, calling for $2 a day. In a rare moment of racial solidarity, white longshoremen joined alongside them. In Louisville, Kentucky, Marauding strikers closed factories and attacked rail tracks, which belonged to the Louisville-Nashville line. There were also massive strikes and disorders in Baltimore, throughout New York State, and throughout the rest of Pennsylvania. In Chicago, the unrelenting force of modernization was taking its toll on the second city. It was the number one rail hub in the entire country. Anyone traveling by rail to the upper Midwest eventually found their way to Chicago. This amount of business led to massive amounts of inequality and greed. The working people were represented by the Working Men's Party, or the WPUSA, which was originally organized in Philadelphia in 1876. It was the first Marxist political organization and party in American history. Its leaders were Philip Van Patten and Albert Parsons. Philip Van Patten was the son of a renowned botanist, whose Dutch roots are well recorded. He spent most of his early life in Costa Rica. It's unclear what influenced his beliefs, but it's more than likely a combination of his father's progressive Whig sentiments and his experiences as a boy in Central America. Albert Parsons was a former Confederate soldier. Following the war, he denounced the Confederacy, supported Reconstruction, and went on to become a Republican and then later an anarchist socialist. He left the South after he made a permanent enemy with the KKK, who attempted to kill him after he was found registering black people to vote. On July 23rd, Parsons stood before 30,000 on Market Street. He urged the Grand Army of Starvation to join the Grand Army of Labor. He went on to say, quote, A mighty spirit is animating the hearts of the American people today. When I say American people, I mean the backbone of this country. The men who till the soil, who guide the machines, who weave the fabrics and cover the backs of civilized men. We are part of that people, and we demand that we be permitted to live, that we shall not be turned upon the earth as vagrants and tramps." Unquote. At this final declaration, the crowd responded, Pittsburgh, 
Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Authorities quickly hired Pinkerton agents as private security and posted local militias in the affluent parts of town. The next day, police took it a step further, deputizing the unemployed and allowing them to carry heavy clubs. They went about the rail yards, roughing up protesters who were isolated. The next day, street battles began to erupt, and they would last into the night. Police and private deputies fought the citizens with clubs, bats, knives, and pistols. That night, the police stormed an entirely peaceful local carpenters' meeting. The carpenters defended themselves with the furniture they created, fighting off police batons with sofas and stools. In the fight, Carpenter was killed by gunfire when police shot him through the back of the head. Throughout the entire horrible conflagration, 30 people died. The 70,000 miles of railroad which had been constructed was, in the words of Philip Dre, quote, revealed to be only as impregnable as its least contented workers, unquote. It infuriated many railroad magnates who were beside themselves at the fact that more protesters were not shot by the soldiers they had called to arms. Tom Scott of the Pennsylvania line suggested that strikers should try, quote, a rifle diet for a few days and see how they like that kind of bread, unquote. In St. Louis, the final great upheaval of 1877 was about to take place. The city had long been a radical alcove in a highly conservative state. During the Civil War, Missouri was in a state of constant upheaval, perpetually suffering from guerrilla raids and small-scale bushwhackings. One place in which the loyalty toward the Union never faltered was St. Louis. There, the large number of progressive German immigrants turned St. Louis into a mini-Germany, in a city named after a French king. Many of these Germans were veterans of the German revolutions of 1848, while others belonged to the First Internationale, or the International Working Men's Association, or IWA for short, which was founded by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in Germany, eventually moving its headquarters to New York. The IWA failed due to constant bickering between Marxists, anarchists, and the dozens of other political opinions which permeated the organization. But it's largely thanks to these radicals that Missouri remained loyal to the Union. Robert E. Lee blamed the Germans for the loss of Missouri, and Lincoln said that without Missouri, quote, the whole game would be up, unquote. Germans also made up a huge number of the generals on the Union side, most famous of them being Franz Sigal, whose German division saved the day against the Confederacy at the Battle of Pea Ridge in 1862. Besides Chicago, St. Louis was the largest rail hub in the country, and for anyone traveling south to east or vice versa, it was the only connection. Additionally, the outskirts of St. Louis constituated the second most productive mining region outside of the anthracite in Pennsylvania. All of these factors lined up in the working class's favor, when the entire workforce, even the newsboys, struck together and quickly gained complete control of the gateway to the West. The city's economy ground to a halt, and a commune under the leadership of Peter A. Lofgren, Albert Curlin, and Henry F. Allen was declared to run the city's basic functions. The worst nightmare of the authorities had come to pass. They claimed the entire nationwide strike was the work of foreign communists and that the IWA was running things from foreign countries. In reality, the IWA did not approve the strikes and were completely thrown off guard by the events. They had very few leaders in command of any of the discordant movements. Regardless, Marx saw the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 as the first true confrontation between labor and capital in the United States though he realized it would not be successful in any significant way. The St. Louis Commune failed for a number of reasons, the most obvious one being the lack of coordination between strike leaders. Other reasons include racism against black workers, lack of action on the Commune's part, failure to act decisively in the first days of the Commune, and failure to compromise between the various groups. German workers were suspicious of the Irish for being too conservative. Irish laborers held racist sentiments toward black workers. The liberals were suspicious of the anarchists and their intention, and the rank and file were frustrated with the commune's lack of activity after the public gatherings and speeches were over.
The authorities, meanwhile, were mobilizing in a major way and working hand-in-hand -hand with private entities to regain control of the city. Employers demanded their workers join local militias and then refused to pay them for their efforts. Those workers who refused were fined and blacklisted. The local bishop, Patrick John Ryan, was even involved in the authorities' plans. He put forward a truly diabolical plan to gain time for the authorities to mobilize. The corporate leaders should agree to the workers' demands and then call a meeting of the board of directors, who would delay their final decision until such a time when the authorities were certain they could regain control of the city. Then the board of directors would outright refuse the workers' demands, leaving the corporations and the government with all the power. Mayor Overstolz said he knew for certain that there were no less than, quote, 30,000 socialists, unquote, who were fully armed and building barricades. In reality, the commune had no weapons to arm the workers, and the instances of violence in the city were extremely isolated and sparse. Regardless, the mayor said, quote, shoot them on the spot. Do you understand me? Kill them. Do not bring in any prisoners, unquote. Six companies of federal troops and a further 300 soldiers of the 23rd Infantry were sent to St. Louis to bolster the already sizable private and state militias. To finalize the authorities' machinations, they created a so-called Committee of Public Safety, a strangely revolutionary title for their dubious and autocratic purposes. They doubled down on their propaganda against the commune, saying, quote, the majority of them were black people, the remainder poor white trash, all were from the dregs of humanity, unquote. The workers marched through town with bread atop sticks, an obvious sign of what was being requested, food and a living wage. The commune allowed many businesses to continue their operations if they had perishable products, and almost all the strikes discussed today allowed passenger and mail trains through their protests, so as not to be made unpopular by the everyday civilian, and so as not to draw federal troops into their cities. However, local gun clubs sided and joined with the authorities. The conflict was heading toward a climax. When business leaders called a meeting in the outskirt town of Carondelet, WPUSA strikers were in the crowd and quickly co-opted the entire meeting, electing one of their own as the leader of this future militia. The commune, realizing the strength of the Committee of Public Safety, tried to organize all the existing unions in the city in the hopes of negotiating an end to the strike. But the private industrialists and railroad magnates smelled blood in the water. They would not negotiate with the rabble. 10,000 men were estimated to be arrayed against the workers of St. Louis. $10,000 was raised for the Allied private and federal army, and the newest Springfield rifles and Colt revolvers were earmarked for shipping. Additionally, two Civil War generals were called out of retirement to deal with the crisis. A.J. Smith and John S. Marmaduke had fought against one another during the Civil War. Now they came together to fight against protesting workers. 700 militia, under John D. Stevenson, were determined to arrest the commune's leadership in a swift action. The cavalry lined up abreast along the width of the main road and advanced against the throngs of curious citizens with reckless abandon. A man was crushed under the hooves of the charge, and cavalrymen horsewhipped women and children out of the way. Shiler Hall, the impromptu headquarters of the commune, was stormed and everyone inside of it arrested. Marx Kruger says, quote, If there was any unlawful activity in St. Louis that day, it was committed by the authorities. Unquote. The commune quickly fell apart as workers turned on each other and blamed one another for the results of the raid. Following a midnight raid in Carondelet, the commune was officially dead, and the authorities returned to power in St. Louis. Everyone who had the slightest connection to the commune was arrested. For what? The authorities were not quite sure. Newspapers decried the commune, saying, quote, The communist wishes the government to take possession of all existing industries and every form of accumulated property and to administer both in the interest of the lazy and the vicious. Another article said the commune wished to, quote, Seize the city and distribute food to the poor, 
so the rich would be unable to buy food, unquote. A week after the strike, the first veiled prophet parade and ball took place. The St. Louis tradition was designed to honor the rich and powerful in the city and to show, in no uncertain terms, who held the reins of power. Its association with Jim Crow, segregation, and the KKK has forced the parade of the veiled prophet to rebrand, so it is now called America's Birthday Parade. But its original purpose, as a conservative military parade celebrating the defeat of the St. Louis Commune, cannot be overstated. Meanwhile, back in the anthracite, the last of the Mollies were heading to the gallows. Supposed Molly gunmen Hester, McGew, and Tully were all scheduled to hang together on March 25, 1878. The sheriff was incredibly drunk as the three men swung at the end of their nooses. The crowd was vast. A 13-year-old girl was killed when the shed on which she was standing collapsed. Next was Jack Kehoe, supposed ringleader of the Molly Maguire movement. He argued bitterly and forcefully for his freedom and innocence, to no avail. His execution was scheduled for December 18, 1878. The gallows trap was faulty. The initial fall did not break Kehoe's neck. He died of agonizing strangulation. The most botched executions were those of James McDonnell and Charles Sharp. Both were convicted of slaying a mine boss a decade and a half prior. After winning an initial reprieve, their new hanging date was January 14, 1879, between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. At 10.25, the sheriff knocked on their doors. At 10.30, the governor granted a reprieve. At 10.37, the news reached the Ma Chunk Telegraph office. To recount what happens next from Mark Bullock, quote, the telegraph messenger rang for admittance, only to be ignored, probably on the assumption that he was a distraught relative. Thirty seconds later, McDonnell and Sharp dropped into eternity. The former died instantly, but the latter struggled violently. In the hush that accompanied his death throes, the ringing bell was heard, and the breathless messenger led in with the news. Half a minute too late. The sheriff... Instead of cutting down the wrongly hanged, took the time to inform the crowd of the contents of the telegraph. Gentlemen, he announced, this is a dispatch for preving the two men till Monday the 20th. It is marked received at the post office at 1037. By time he was done, Sharp had stopped struggling. The sheriff turned toward the swaying bodies and said, I am as sorry as anyone. It is too late to be helped. Where's the undertaker? Unquote. When the sheriff was accused of murder by the deceased family, he blamed the priest for hastening the men's death. The New York Times headline the next day was, quote, 30 seconds too late, unquote. In all, there were 20 executions of the Mollies. Whether these men were responsible for the crimes on which they were accused and found guilty has been a contention in history since the hangings occurred. Most presume Franklin Gowan bribed officials and jurists to gain complete control of the mines and the railroads, while also getting rid of labor agitators. In the end, Gowan's scheme failed. He had overplayed his hand, and the profits he promised to his lenders never materialized. His reading line went into receivership, and in 1889, he blew his brains out with a pistol. His legacy is not one of merit nor wealth. The hangings were retried a hundred years later, and many of the Mollies received a post-mortem pardon from the state. The Mollies passed into local legend, as did the supposed actions of prisoner Alexander Campbell. He was inhabiting cell 17 in Ma Chunk Penitentiary. Before being led to the gallows, Campbell used his right hand to leave an imprint high on his cell wall. He had sworn he was innocent. He said, quote, There is proof of my words. That mark of mine will never be wiped out. There it will remain forever to shame the country that is hanging an innocent man. Unquote. Although many attempted to erase the handprint, it was visible well into the 20th century. In spite of being covered with plaster now, the print remains. The plastered over handprint is an apt parallel for the American labor movement. It has been castigated and manipulated. <laughs> 
but it remains, in spite of the plaster. The first great conflict between the two forces, capital and labor in America, would not be the last. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877 claimed the lives of over a hundred American workers. The strike's spontaneity led to its downfall. The unprecedented government response made clear on whose side the Republican and Democratic elite were. They put aside years of bitter sectional differences to crush organized labor, and the increase in National Guard strength can be directly linked to combating labor unrest. The labor movement learned many lessons as well. They figured out that through striking, they could seriously hamper the bottom lines of their bosses on the railroads. They also came to realize that the federal government would rarely, if ever, side with the worker. To take power, they needed their own parties which represented their own interests. Many socialists would come to be a part of local government across the country. They were especially popular in the Midwest, as socialist parties gained traction in Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. In the next episode, we will be covering the rise of organized labor during the period between 1879 and 1892. The government's response to the upheavals would be equally violent, and they would stoop to new lows to side with private business in achieving their ultimate goal, the subjugation of the working poor. Legends will rise, villains will manifest, bombs will be hurled, and cowards will take power in the next episode of Turning Tides. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm your host, Joseph Pascone. I hope you like this approach to our seasons a little better. I felt that in season two I covered a lot of things, but was never able to get into the nitty-gritty. So from now on, Turning Tides will be covering only one or two, maybe three, subjects per season. I chose the American labor movement because places like Schuylkill County St. Louis and Martinsburg are not the places one recalls when remembering radical American towns. And I think it's pertinent during the resurgence of slashing workers' rights and refusing to accommodate the cost of living to remind people that we have only what little we have today because of these movements. Additionally, the gun battles in the street and the bitter class division on display were not the quintessential America one thinks of when remembering the late 19th century. In fact, the late 19th century is hardly covered in any history class. But if one wants to understand the Great Depression, the rise of socialism in America, and the American labor movement, it is necessary to study this period of time. Thank you all again so much for listening. Please rate, review, Share, tell your friends, and let us know what you think. If you like what you heard today, you can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast, as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices, and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. Thank you again.